going. One more and we're ready to go. Okay, I had a big aha. Uh -huh. I have a sponsor. I sponsor one of my friends as, a, as an agent. And she got her first listing calling the first for sale by owner. And I'm okay. coming with her. And I learned from that that she just believed in me more than I do. Well, little Wendy, I, I heard that your friend got a for sale by owner listed, correct? Did I hear that right, Sebastian? All right. So, Sebastian has a question for everyone. And the question is, all right, you, I can see everyone except Pamela. And you can, Pamela, you can just look in a mirror. That'll be the same as being on a camera, right? So I want you to give me a thumbs up if you've re, if you're consistently reporting your numbers give me a thumb up if you're reporting your numbers on the google sheet that sebastian gave you i i don't see i see one i see one finger up one finger down the rest of the rest of you guys look like grade school when the teacher asks the question you're afraid they're going to call on you so you put your head down i used to do that all the time never right so here's the thing you guys um we even had a little discussion. That means one or two things. And, and let's just assume you guys are on a game show and I'm the host. I'm going to ask you the question and you can give us the answer. If people aren't reporting their numbers, would that mean A, they're so busy with business they don't have time to report their numbers. B, they're doing all their contacts. They just forget about it. Or C, they're not doing the, the, the activities Therefore, they don't want to be held accountable. How many people would say they're so busy with business they don't have time? We How about, did. well, you do, they're doing all the work and they just forget it. Or answer C is they're probably not doing it and therefore they don't want to stand on the screen. C. All right, so bold pivot is about perfect, uh, um, not about perfection, it's about progress. So here's the thing. This is one of the things I believe me, I understand Sebastian's point is this. Uh, and forgive me for like, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, you guys are on the call. So you're, you want to be held accountable. We'll add value to this call in a minute. However, being a rain man, uh, that's what they call me, rainmaker. They call me rain man, like Dustin Hoffman, like the movie, is that um, it can be, it, it's a skill I have not mastered yet on reporting numbers. So what we have done, like the concept of pain and pleasure, reporting numbers is a non-negotiable for us because that's like being on a diet and never standing on the scale. You know, if you never stand on a scale, your weight can be whatever it wants to be in your mind. Now that doesn't mean you can get the pants button. However, you can be whatever. You can have a 32 inch waist or whatever. So I had, I had my team sign a, a um, their commitment activities. My team can set their own goals, just like Sebastian, you can set your own goals. However, in bold and bold pivot, they do teach the concept of pain and pleasure. Now, who remembers that being taught in bold? Which one is a better motivator? Are we uh, walking towards pain or avoiding, uh, I mean, walking towards pleasure or avoiding pain? Which one is a bigger motivator? Pain, yes, you're right. So here's the thing. Um, I had them come up with their own pain. If they did not do their activities they committed to, then they, they had a consequence. Now I know growing up that, you know, my, I was raised by my grandparents and, and she would make me eat what was on the plate. I don't know if you were raised that way. I don't know if parents raised kids that way. You know, I guess there's pr probably no problem with kids eating their happy meals. However, my grandmother made things like liver and onions and McDonald's has never served liver and onions. And I didn't get the dessert unless I ate my food. And in real estate, what we have is that there's so much freedom is that we, we treat ourselves to things even though we haven't earned it. So I had them take something important away. One of my, one of my agents who's doing an amazing job, her pain was there's this restaurant in Cape Coral called Lobster Lady. If she does not hit her activities, and report her numbers for the week, she can't go to Lobster Lady for the rest of the month. I've got another individual that his downtime is playing Call of Duty on, I don't know, one of those 
PlayStations. I don't know what game it. I don't know what it's on. Although I get that, I used to play games until I found out it was really way too time consuming. So his his pain is he's bringing in his joystick, and I did ask him if he has more than one because I don't want to be tricked. He's only got one little controller, so that's going to be his pain. Another one is we have this young lady, very pretty young lady, um, that if she's not, if she doesn't hit her numbers, get this, she doesn't wear makeup for a week. <laughs> so we may not see her in the office. I don't really know. So here's the thing. If you don't do the things you're, you, if, your concept, if, you're, if you're not doing the activities and reporting the numbers, somebody who can talk, Get, un unmute yourself. This is a coaching session. This is not a, uh, I'm not preaching here. If you don't do it, what is the cost to you? If you Better don't write it down. No listing, no business, no money, no nothing. Tons of things. Suffering. Yes, keep going. You're all right. Jesus. Um, no point? money, no fun, yeah. He's been working. Buyers are more hours. Yes. You're right. More work. Disappointment. Letting your people down is a thing. Yes. How about looking at those little eyeballs of people in your family? Our decisions basically will affect our family if you have one or your future family when you get one. And I was talking to another realtor the other day and I said, well, listen, you know, he was, had, you know, he was struggling like we all do with accountability. And I said, I want you to think of lead generation as Harvard for your daughter. You realize with a 3% conversion ratio, 3%. So that means if you made 100 calls, you only get three appointments for people to want to talk to you. That, that doesn't necessarily mean listening. All right. If you did that and made 100 contacts every week and with a 3% conversion ratio, that would be... That would be on a normal on a normal month, 12 appointments, 12 appointments in a month, right? Every week having three appointments. You know what Gary Keller says? If you have three kitchen tables, well, we'll, we'll call it a Zoom maybe. Maybe it, it could be kitchen tables too. If you have consistently three kitchen tables a week, do you know what Gary says your income is going to be? Million dollars? Million dollars. Before is the oh yeah, yeah. Miguel, this is where oh yeah comes in. Oh yeah. There you go. There you go. Dale. <laughs> so Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. Nice to have you on the call. So with, with that in mind, I mean, it kind of changes perspective. And Gary said in, on a recent call is that many agents are going broke so slow they don't even know it. That one hit me, Danny. You did, Miguel? Yeah. Tell me, when, when did you hear that first time? From you last week, yep. you know, money's coming in, money's coming out. But when, when you're not really paying attention to the numbers and you're not getting after the business, you know, you're before you know it, you're spending a little bit more out than what's coming in. And, and that one hit me. That one made me, gave me a good aha. Well, if you think, thank you so much, Miguel. If you think basically, would it, would it be tremendously painful and, and um, traumatizing to report your numbers? Yes. <laughs> no. I mean, it's, it's not like a root canal, is it? So I, 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 haven't, I haven't got uh, Sebastian's permission on this yet. However, here's the thing. So if you report your numbers today and every day until next Monday when we meet, every day, mm -hmm. and you know, it's all about progress. And, and so maybe you're not doing any calls. You can do three calls, five calls, whatever it is. Miguel will take you, again, we'll, we'll, get, we'll buy you a, um, and your whole family a week stay in Disney, Disney World. <laughs> Miguel? Miguel? The Miguel, bubble. you better, you want to you wanna come back here and make sure you're getting... You know what you're promising here. I love it. So, do you, uh, Sebastian, do you hear what you uh, were willing to do? You said Miguel. Oh, I said Miguel? Yes. Oh. Yeah, you oh. said, no, well, he said Miguel and Sebastian, so I wasn't sure which way this was going. I was ready to go to Disney World. Yeah, well, awesome. So, here's the thing. You guys are on the call, so let's get off this subject onto something else. Uh, how many people had a better week this week than the week before? 
I did. It's progress, guys, not perfection. So then really, then here's the thing, okay? So if you're in the gym and you're bench pressing 45 pounds, you know, or 145 or Miguel, maybe 345, whatever it is, right? Then um, can you add another five pounds? So this week, will you purpose to be incrementally better? Because here's the talked about this last week. Success is not gradual. It's gradual then suddenly. suddenly. So here, here's my challenge for you. Will you pinky promise that you will do your report your numbers regardless of how good or how bad they are? Will you please do that? Pinky promise. Yes. I do. I will. I do. I pinky promise. Okay. Awesome. You know, it's yeah. funny because I mentioned it this morning when we're talking about daily accountability and I asked who was in and just about everybody is looking for this, Jenny. We all want it. And yet the doing it part is funky. Uh, you know what? I, um, I actually keep track of my numbers on an Excel spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. And I just uh, click on the link that Sebastian uh, sent. And I, I, I wasn't turning my numbers because I thought I had to fill up another Excel spreadsheet. And it was going to be a lot of work. But uh, I just looked at the link. And it's not. it's just like five, six questions on number of contacts, number of appointments on the board. So I just did it. It took me 30 seconds because I already have the information in Excel. So wow. I, just wanted to, I just wanted to mention that. Thank you, Mario. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mario. Oh. All right. So, hey, I'm your, I'm your coach here. I'm coming in, uh, whatever you need. What, what would you like to talk about first? Where, where are some roadblocks, some uh, role plays you want to do, some questions about the material? Um, how yeah. to disqualify buyers or sellers? Like who you definitely kick out? Um, like what are some signs that, you know, there either be sometimes with us girls flirting with us or trying to delay and have a bunch of excuses. What are those major things that would help us to know? Okay, so Marcia, break it down for me. Give me a scenario. Give me, maybe you are, you're dealing with it now or you dealt with it. Um, oh, like, oh, I'm waiting for my kids to go to college, you know, but we wanted to, you know, we got a lot of calls for realtors. What do you charge? I'm like, well, great, let's meet. Oh no, our kids are going to college, you know, not yet. So uh, we'll call you when we're ready. Or, I mean, just type of, uh, or I had another guy who said that, oh, I need to sell my, ha I want to sell my duplex, but my girlfriend moved to Tampa, I was supposed to move with her and I need to first break up with her before I sell it. Cause otherwise, but they don't own it together. I mean, just a bunch of like excuses that you kind of like, is that fog or is it just next? Or, I mean, I don't know, everybody else <laughs> has like crazy um, excuses. Well, for the guy who has to break up, I just grabbed his phone, let me call her, I'll, I'll handle it for you really fast. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and then I have a crazy Latina on my back. <laughs> here's, here's the issue on when, when you're talking to buyers and sellers that are kind of giving you the little dance. Um, you have to ask them kind of the, uh, uh, maybe one of those questions that kind of a slap upside the head. Well, I understand you, you want to break up with your girlfriend. Let me ask you this, uh, Marcia, just role play with me on that. Other than that, other than that, is there any other reason? This is the isolation. This is a formula we talked about two weeks ago. Other than that, is there any other reason why you wouldn't move forward? No, I, but there's some violations on the house, but other than that, no. Okay, so if you, if you knew that you could sell your duplex for um, more money now than you can in the future, would you, would you want to sell now or wait? Well, yeah, I want to sell now. But so you I need to do that first, you know. Well, you're going to have to ask some questions. Like, is it possible, get what Gary Keller said, with the market's going to change, who knows what's happened to the election, who knows what's happening in the future, is it possible instead of the market, the house is going like this, the market could lose 30%. Is that possible? Yes, it is. Yes. So what's the value of the duplex? Oh, this one, 550. 550? Well, let's just use 10%. So here's the deal. If you sold now, and if you, if you wait, it may cost you $50,000. Is it, is it worth waiting? Or would you rather take advantage of the market we're in now? 
oh, but then I need to rent somewhere and wait to buy something when the foreclosures hit the market. Well, okay. So again, again, is there any motivation? Is there any motivation for him to sell? And you know, you, you've got an investment property there. So, so generally speaking, when you're dealing with a seller that has a house that they, they want to go to get something bigger, something smaller, they want to move North, they want to move South, they may, may want to move West. Can't really go east from you guys so <laughs> there has to be some motivation then there, the motivation i'm a, i'm attempting to hit the hit between the eyes is the motivation is the market is right now at a at a such a pace i have not seen a market like this in more than i don't even i said 10 or 15 years i don't know that i've ever seen this speed so let me ask you a question you you want this to be a good investment or a medium investment a good investment of course then you want to sell when the market's higher, when the market's low, uh, on the way down. Mm, of, of the way up, of course. And that's today, correct? I guess, I don't know, what are the stats? Okay, well, you, you can give the stats. If the stats did support it though, Pam, uh, Marcia, would it make sense to move forward now? Okay. Have you, have you, do you know what the interest rates are right now? Yes. Okay, what are they? I, I, you're in real. You're the, you're the investor. Uh, like, three, they've been saying they're really low? Yeah, they're under 3%, right? Mm, yeah. Does that make it great for buyers? Mm, yeah, I mean, I wanted to buy something cash with the money I get. Right, and that means there's a lot of buyers in the market now, which means that you can get more if you're, maybe they're living in the duplex, I don't know. It may, may not be an investment property, that was my mistake. So here's the thing is that if you sell high, then if you, if you were to rent something and you think the market's going to go down, would it be better to buy, sell high and, and buy in a lower market? Yes. So part of the whole, you know, so you, here's the thing is that they may be answering questions like that. However, probably the best way to find out their motivation is use what's, what I say one to 10 and they can use for a buyer or seller. And um, Marsha just, Let's go back to your guys. So let me just, so I can understand your motivation and I can mirror your, mirror your motivation on a scale of one to 10, one meaning you probably don't want to sell now and 10 meaning you'd like to sell today. Where do you find yourself on that scale? Oh, probably like seven. Now here's the thing is that the, the, the important part of a one to 10, and I always use this. Um, and if you're raising kids, you can ask kids like on a scale of one to 10, one meaning you're not going to take out the trash and 10 means you're going to do it. Where do you find yourself on that scale? The important question is what you ask next is, okay, so what is it going to take to get you to a 10? You're at a seven. Awesome. What oh. happens to get you to a 10? And what, what, what might a seller say? I got to find something else. Uh, COVID has to be over. Um, a buyer the same way. I mean, are you are you working with any buyers that are sitting on the fence right now? Mm, yeah. I would have, I mean, you can, although I, I'm finding more sellers are on the fence than buyers because unless a buyer wants, wants to think it's, well, I'm gonna wait until things get, you know, I'm gonna wait till the market turns around and becomes a buyer's market again. How would you guys handle that, you guys? I'm sure you run into that. I'm a buyer and I'm saying, hey, look, this market's crazy. I don't want to buy in this kind of a market. I want to wait for it to go, you know, turn the other way. Who wants to handle that objection? Well, oh, Sandra Seuss, that is her jam. Okay. So, Mr. Sa Danny, you're telling me you want to move. So you're going to eventually buy. Isn't the interest rate now just amazing and you have all the opportunities, your credit is exactly where you need it to be. So let's say you wait, what do you think is going, could happen? Are you going to be as confident that you can buy what you need tomorrow as you are today? Uh, there's always an unknown. However, interest rates have been low for like 10, 10 years. And so if it goes to four or something, I, I won't price me out of the market. It'll be bad. I mean, However, I, 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 could, I could afford it. So, Danny, that is great. But tell me, do you know what is the difference between a 3% interest rate in a 4 in a 30 years loan compared to a 4%? I mean, 4% is low, definitely. But 3% is just something that we haven't seen 
for the past 30 years probably. You can't compete with that in essence. It could potentially save you tens of thousands of dollars over a lifetime of the loan. Wouldn't that be something that you would want to save? You guys are great. Those are great questions. Sandra, uh, Marsha, 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 awesome. Let's take a different path. Let's take a different tack now that uh, other than interest rates, what else might get a buyer off the fence and a buyer saying, listen, I mean, I don't want to, I don't, I'm, I'm okay. I mean, I, I, we, we need a bigger house. My wife's having a baby. I get that. However, this market's so crazy. I don't want to get into a bidding war. I want to wait for it to cool down. Well, Jenny, my concern is I don't have the crystal ball as what is going to happen. I know that the best time to buy is when you need to, to buy. Okay. Well, I don't need to buy. I mean, it would just be nice. I just like, I don't want to overpay. Hmm. Okay. My other concern, honestly, Jenny, is with all the money that the federal government is issuing, you know, probably the inflation effect is going to hit us. And that means it's going to be more expensive in one or two years than it is today. Couldn't you? Have you thought about that? Well, do you know that to be a fact, Sandra? I don't have the crystal ball, but the amount of money that they are throwing to the street, eventually, I mean, I studied economics, and there is a lot of supply and demand, and eventually when you have so much extra supply of money, you know, cost of living goes higher. And the only thing that really holds value is the real estate. So if you buy today at a very low interest rate and either the market stays stable or inflation kicks in another 5 7%, you're still better off, aren't you? Right. So that was a great tie down, great statement. So, so I'm going to go again. Give me a question. These are all great ideas. I want you to, think, I want you to keep thinking. What's a question that you could ask a buyer? That would make that might make them stop in their tracks. You came up with two good ideas: interest rates is, and the fear of that is pain. And of course, then um, then Sandra's point was that that the um, I know you're talking about the government infusing money into it. I guess you're you're suggesting that's going to make uh, keep the economy rolling and keep prices moving up. Is that your point? Yeah, I'm actually really a little bit afraid of that. I don't really know how it's going to end up. So, okay, so what would be a great question you could ask a buyer on the fence right now? So, you know, how, I mean, today's affordability is really the opportunity for you to buy a bigger house. And, you know, you even start building your home equity today. And your taxes are going to be taxed at today's property value because you're going to be able to get your homestead. Are you familiar with the savings of a homestead home? Great, good question. Here, here's where I'm going with this, you guys. There's, there's a lot of different moves on a chessboard. So I'm gonna go to, uh, see, I see, I know that Mar Mario, you're in a quiet spot. Can you unmute just for a moment? Thank you. Uh, so Mario, you're the buyer. So it's you, you're thinking about waiting. Let me ask you a question. Um, would you have been better off to buy last year than, than now? If you, if, you had a, if you could roll back the clock to this a year ago, would you have been better off to buy then versus in the market now? I would say uh, probably yes, because the prices were maybe not as high as today. Right. What about the year before? Yeah, sure. I mean, I guess if you go back uh, two years, three years, uh, probably the prices were not as high as they are today. In fact, you could go back 10 years. What if you could buy 10 years ago? Would you have been better off? Uh, yes. So let me ask you a question. No, I'm going to put, put you in a time machine. I'm going to get you the, the um, what do you call it? The DeLorean with a flux capacitor. We're going to go back in time 10 years. And the buyer is uh, on the fence, just like you're on the fence, waiting for the prices to come down, right? Yeah. He didn't buy 10 years ago. What advice would you give him today? Now, I mean, going back 10 years, what advice would you give him? Buy now. Why? Because that buyer has been waiting 10 years for the market to correct, correct? Correct. 
So my question is, do you want to be that buyer now and have another buyer from the future come back in five years and said, Mario, you were waiting on something that never happened. You should have got in when you should have got in five years ago. You see where I'm going with that? Yeah. How long are they willing to wait for something? People waited 10 years and the market hasn't corrected yet. And we were hearing the same thing 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. Great. So that would be another angle. Miguel, Miguel, you want to say that something? That was great. That was great. May I, may I say something? Sure. Um, this is Marcia. What if, um, you know, it's not necessarily a question. What's the question to you and everyone? For example, in the city of North Miami, where, you know, the inventory in a certain price category, I mean, is very low, you know, and I know this, I know this for a fact. Um, what if I come to the buyer and said, you know, um, Mr. Buyer, you know, on Northeast 121st Terrace, I mean, you know, there's, a, there's quite a few homes for, for sale. And in that, the price category that you satisfy, you know, they have one or two homes um, for sale and it's a very hot street. So wouldn't it be better for you to make an offer on one of these homes now that fits your buying criteria rather than wait? And it, it's going to be gone probably like next week. Wouldn't, wouldn't you, how, how would you feel about that, Mr. Buyer? All right, so, here, so uh, th you're putting them into pain. However, if I could coach you on something there just for a moment, whenever you, if you use the, would you make an offer, you're using, you're attempting to coax them into, all right, the idea of maybe I can get it for less. And then the way you kind of set that scenario up, and I know in some price ranges, Marcia, there's, the homes are going fast over asking right. I, I instruct my people not to use the term offer. Okay. What do you use? Well, here's the thing is that, um, look, really quick story, you guys. When, when you are working with a buyer, and we talked about some of this a week or so ago, um, and you know that they're making an offer, they're, they're, they're making an offer on a listing that has no chance of it going through. You know, it's maybe it's been on a market like three hours and 15 cars in a driveway want to show it, then they want to offer 10% less, 5% less, or they're not even going to go over asking price. One of the things I've learned over my years is this, never, never give them any hope at all that it's going to be accepted. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I gotcha. Makes sense. So let you elaborate, me, Betty? You understand what I'm saying here? Yeah. Buyers, elaborate. Buyers will attempt to get you on their side. They'll send you a trial balloon to see if, if you kind of buy into that thing, like, oh, all right, we can write it up. Versus saying, hey, listen, you know, we're, we're killing trees here. It's just not going to work. Case in point, you guys, I, I, I remember this, you know, who, who likes buying cars? I mean, all they got that Carvana now where you, it's like a vending machine with cars in it. And they have other ways of doing that. The traditional way of going into the dealer, nobody likes that, right? And so I'm dealing with a salesman attempting to negotiate. And then of course they, then they do the four squares and, and sales. And then they, then they do the TO. That's a turnover to the sales manager, right? It's a system that's, I don't like it. Anyway, I was attempting to negotiate on a car. I, I wanted to make an offer on the, on the car and the salesman led me to believe, and it was an aggressive offer and the salesman I thought, Man, led me to believe in my psyche that there was some magical pixie dust day that, 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 that would fall on the sales manager's ears and he would take it. And then here's the thing, the problem with that is, is when reality comes back with a counter it is so devastating, it takes all the emotion and joy out of the deal. So you guys have to be stoic. I use the term in my presentation, blameless. You guys have to be stoic and say, okay, so, so I like the question, just to review it with you guys, say, listen, um, uh, Miguel, hey, listen, uh, I, I work with a lot of different people. Let me just ask you a question, how, how direct, can I be with you? Let's say one is not very direct and 10 is like 
bullseye. How direct can I be with you? No, you 10, 10 for sure. I want you to be honest. Well, no, no, no. Notice I was just going to bring this up. Notice I, no, direct. you're always a 10 when it comes to honesty. However, you can be direct. Like for example, the, the, the other example there, Sandra had, or no, it was, uh, it was Marcia that has the guy that wants to break up. You can break up direct or indirect, right? So, so I say, so I, now, how direct can I be with you? You say 10. Well, here's the deal. In this market, that, that offer stands practically zero chance of being considered. Yep, zero chance. That wasn't too bad. So would you, would you rather me tell you that up front so you can maybe think of a different strategy or would you rather see that basically, would you rather suffer the disappointment when the seller rejects your offer and you don't get the house? That's it. Um, up front, I'd rather you tell me sooner. Now, what's interesting, and I don't work with a lot of buyers anymore, so you guys can help me. Do you have any buyers you work with that don't believe how fast the market's going? And, 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 and the most you attempt to school them on this and you give them your best shot of getting, getting them to make a better, quote, offer, mm -hmm. they want to do it their way. Do you guys ever have that? Yep, it's happening more and more. Yes. So would you like to, would you like to have, see, uh, let me model that conversation. Please. All right, so I, I'm gonna spread the wealth here. Um, to, uh, I've got uh, S Sebastian, uh, I've already used Mario. Kevin, can you talk? Unmute. Yeah, uh, yes. All right, Groovy. All right, so you're a buyer coming into the market and you know, you're new, you haven't been seasoned yet. And the, house is, the house is listed at 285, been on the market for a day and you like it, you know, and you, you want to make an offer. And so my conversation is going to be, Kevin, this is the meat thermometer. You've heard this before. You actually have the script, I think in my slideshow. Okay. Well, Kevin, I know you're new to this market. Let me ask you a question and there's no right or wrong. Do you, do you think the market as a buyer you think the market as a buyer is working in your favor or working against you right now? Uh, it looks like it's working against me. It's, you know, it's not a lot of houses, you know, for me to choose from right now. Right. Well, that's what we call uh, it's, You're right. It, it, well, it's kind of working in your favor because interest rates are record low and you certainly want to take advantage of that. Right. Yes, for sure. However, it's working against buyers. Now, notice I didn't say it's working against you. Sometimes you want to use the pronoun. Sometimes you want to be general. The market right now is working against buyers, particularly in your price range, because there's more buyers than sellers. That's why they call it a seller's market. Got it. So this house that we just looked at today is new on the market. You said you liked it and you wanted to make an offer on it, right? Yeah, I do. I would love to make an offer on that. It, it's, you know, it's out of what we've seen so far, it's what I like. Okay, so on a scale of one to 10, one is not very direct and 10 is really direct. How, how direct for me to be? Um, very direct. Let's, you know, I, I really would like to make an offer on this. So okay. I would like to be very direct and, you know, Dennis, everything you've said so far has been great. So, All right. Well, it's been my experience that the probability of the seller is going to respond to the offer. Let's say it's 285 and you went to offer like, 7% because somebody told you, and don't ever use this, you guys, don't ever say list the sales price ratio or it's not, that is not even correct. It's sales to list price ratio is 93%. Don't ever give buyers that statistic because they all think they have to use it. So let's say they heard that, read that some, well, I heard it's like, you know, 97, 90, 93%. So let's go 7% less. Okay. Here's, the, so my question is this, there's almost 0% chance that the seller is going to consider that. Now, I want you to be the buyer that does not really believe me. Yep. So can't I get this one? The reason I'm about to say it is, can't we just make the offer and then we can negotiate from there? Mm. That's what they always say. And they go lower than that. They'll go like 220. And like, okay, let's just make the offer. And then we'll they'll negotiate, right? And if, All right. So I'm going to some way. Ways to handle that. So let me, ask, let me ask you something, Kevin. If you were a seller, and you had offers that were lower, you know, 10% lower than asking price and 10% above asking price, did you waste time negotiating with the low ones? Um, hmm. No, but how, do we know what offers he already have? Can't we find that out? 
Well, we we will definitely find it out. I mean, I can call and, and the other agent, you know, and the other agent, there were seven showings today. So do you think it's a possibility there's somebody else that likes the house like you do? Maybe. I, I don't know. The market's crazy, you know. I, I get that. Here's a question I want to get to, guys, is this. I, I've been doing this a long time, and I don't know how, I, you know, you've been, you've been, all you guys, I don't care if you're brand new, you've been through this, you, you're watching a lot of transactions. Don't say years. Listen, I've been, I, we're watching dozens and dozens of transactions a day. So you might have only been in it a week. You're still, your office is watching that many transactions. So, the, the, so the, you, you're going to lose out on this house. So what I want you to do is if you're going to go with that strategy, you're not going to own this house. My, my question is, and I want you and you guys to think about this, is how many nice houses like this that would really work for your family are you willing to lose Ooh. making offers before you decide to buy one? How? Repeat that for us, Jenny. I'm writing that one down. How many houses are you willing to lose by making offers on before you decide to step up and buy one? And just say that, like, first meeting? Don't even well, give them time to do this no more? This is like dating. Well, here's the thing. You're a doctor, right? And I've got this poison ivy. And there was a movie made about it called The Greek Wedding. And he says, look here, that's going to spread if you don't do something. Well, no, I'm going to go get Windex on it. Mm -hmm. Like Greek Wedding, right? I'm going to spray Windex on it. And you, I said, okay, well, here's the thing. It, then it's not going to work. And when the, when the poison ivy covers half your body, come and see me. I'll, I'll help you get better. But, you know, what, what they might say is, well, you know, because of the shortage of homes in the market, maybe I should just wait until there's more houses in the market so I'll be able to choose amongst more houses than the limited supply that there's right now. Okay, awesome. Awesome, Mario. So let me ask you a question. So you're moving because you've got a baby on the way, right? How long are you willing to wait before you finally say, you know what, uh, I, I, we got to get a bigger house? How long? I would say we could probably wait another year. Okay. And then in a year, let's say the houses are 15% more, more expensive and the interest rates are up. Th then, then now you're going to get a smaller house than you could have right now. How are you going to feel? Well, we don't know that, right? I mean, we don't know if the prices are going to stay so high or stay the same, or we don't know what's going to happen exactly one year from now. Yes. Let me ask you this question, though. Do you think there were people that feel the same way you did a year ago? And they Probably. Didn't. And if, if, should they, did they make a wise decision by waiting, or should they have bought a year ago? If they could have found the right house at the right price, then they should have bought it. But if they couldn't find the right house at the right price, then maybe it wasn't meant for them to buy last year. And maybe that's why they're in the market right now. And the same thing with me. If we cannot buy the right house at the right price, then maybe it was not meant to be. Well, again, that's, that's kind of subjective, the right house. Have you seen houses that, are, that, that would be considered right? Yeah, but again, there's not that many uh, houses on the market. I, I, you know, maybe I like one out of uh, five that we see, and I'm just not going to make an offer on all of it because I don't like all of them. If I okay. wait for the market to supply more houses, then I might be able to pick out of 10 or 20 instead of just five. Okay, and so if you wait until there's a supply of more houses, that means basically there's been something, a disruption in the market that's made the real estate market turn downward, correct? Correct. And so if the houses are falling in value every day, when do you step in and buy a house? When there's more supply in homes. Uh, you know, right now, it seems like because there's a shortage of homes, the prices are, that, that's pushing the prices of the homes up. But when the opposite occurs, when there's more supply, usually the prices come down. So then I just wait for that to happen. Right. Okay. So one, let me ask, is it possible that will never happen? Probably not. I mean, economies and real estate going cycles, there's always ups and downs, ups and downs. Is it possible it won't happen in the next year? I, I, I have no way of knowing that. See, now, now he's being cantankerous, really, because I'm, yeah. I'm, 
and I'm asking him logical questions. And here's the bottom line is, you know what, here's, it may, buying may not be right for you. However, there, I, I hear this every year I'm in real estate and I've been hearing, there's people out there been waiting 10 years, Mario, for the market to fall. And what has happened over the last 10 years? Uh, yeah, I'm sure that the price has gone up, uh, especially over 10 years, yes. And do you think they kicked themselves because the house they drive by that could have been theirs back if they'd have bought it 10 years ago is nowhere near affordable right now? Yes, I'm sure they do. So, you know, obviously on a, on a motivation scale, you know, believe me, here's the thing, you guys, I know we have to be, you know, we're not really attached to the outcome. However, have you ever had a client that just knows everything about everything? Yes. And no matter what you say, they are going to have an answer for. It's yeah. okay. I don't have a crystal ball either. Isn't it possible though that the market could go another ten years without going down? Then what would that what would that buyer be like? I mean, so anyway, I guess there's no magic pill. However, it's a line of questioning, and at some point in time, you kind of give up on it. So, yeah. Oh, you know, Daddy, one thing that I, I see you do is you, you keep probing and asking questions to really get clarity on where that person is, whether that person is really committed to move forward or, or not. And I guess that's the, the thing that we need to improve on asking quality questions to really find out where that person is, whether it's going to sell or buy. I guess that, that's something that we need to get better at asking better questions well that that's a great observation although i think as demonstrated on this today's call you guys the you know sandra's and the, uh, the people that basically participated uh were pretty good with the questions the difference is that uh, my style is i'm going to ask a question up front and i'm not going to make a statement and then tie it down it's kind of a backward a back-ended question because remember, this is worth remembering, you guys, there's no bad question, just good questions and great questions. And if you can ask a great question that makes them stop to think about their logic and rationale, um, you have a better chance of actually getting them to go in the right direction. Now, we've talked a lot about buyers. Here's the thing, if, if they don't have motivation, I don't, I, you know, I, they're just, I don't know what, there's nothing works on somebody who's not motivated. And um, however, one thing that is, that's not taught anywhere, this is kind of my feeling when you go switch it back to sellers, I will take an overpriced listing if the seller has motivation. Because sooner, if they have motivation, sooner or later, they will capitulate to the market they have to, yeah. or the market might catch up with them. So I don't, I don't believe in like some people believe that you got to go and you got to fight and wrestle them down and, you know, make them sign the listing agreement at your price instead of what they want. Right. And any, any comment or thought on that, you guys? Yeah, I have a comment. Um, I completely agree what you said. I mean, if it's kind of counterintuitive to do that. Um, my name is Damani, by the way. Hi, Damani. Uh, hi. Um, yeah, it's completely counterintuitive. Uh, to try to convince someone to sell at a price that you would like them to sell at because it's not your house. You're just helping them to do it, not to do it your way. Whatever way is, you know, best to them, it's their prerogative. And if, you know, if you can help them do it in the time they want, make the money that they want and in the first place, if you can help them, that's the point. So I completely agree with what you're saying. And you got an awesome radio voice. You should like it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. But, but, but Denny, like, to price, and yes, it's a little bit of a, it's a, well, it's a major seller's market now, but to price, isn't there a point past which a seller's price is way out of line? And I see there's a certain little range, and Marcia had, the, Marcia had this situation this week, where, okay, so if the price is 340, for a seller to tell you 420, that's not the overpriced listing I think I'd be comfortable in taking. But if we're in between, you know, 340, we're at 375, 380-ish, maybe that's okay. Is there a point past which, no, overpriced is overpriced? Well, I mean, within the realm of reason, maybe. However, uh, I don't worry about the numbers so much. I worry about how they answer one question, Barbie. 
Yes. And so you're that seller that wants four forty, and that's something it should be what three fifty, let's say. Mm -hmm. uh, Barbie, just for clarification, uh, your reason for selling is what? I'm taking another job. Okay, another so city. somebody who's taking another job is there maybe some implied motivation there? All right, so here, here's, the thing. here's the thing, you guys. I've turned down listings on principal, and other people have gone in there and. And although it didn't sell where they thought it was, they were able to talk them down or weight them down until it did. But here's the thing. The, the one question they have to answer if they have motivation, here's the question I want you to write down. Barbie, what are you going to do if the market says no at 440? Oh. What am I going to do? Um, what do I have to do? I have to lower it, I guess. But, but isn't everybody talking about it's a seller's market? Why am I going to have to lower it? It is a seller's market. You can probably put more money in your pocket than any other time possible. However, that doesn't mean that sellers can double or quadruple their prices. So when you sell, when you, you're, you're being transferred, right? And so when you step into Orlando, let's see, you're going to Orlando, are you going to just be crazy and spend whatever the seller wants? Or are you going to do some comparison shopping and look for the right value? All right. There's only three things. Who could be who, who's going to be my teacher's pet today? There's only three things that can happen when you list a home. This is my fishing sheet. Did oh, any of you that's Sue. <laughs> Sue has been studying that sheet all week. Sunny Susan Liu, she's got it in her hand. <laughs> my girl. All right, so, so hang on, Sue. I'm going to call you in just a second. So Barbie, so you know you, you're going to have to reposition, right? Yeah. And remember, you just not lower the price. Sellers never like to lower the price. It's all about repositioning. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and, and then the next question is, that's right, you're going to have to reposition. So let me ask you this, and I speak metaphorically, how long would you take the wrong medicine that you knew that wasn't working before you took the right medicine? Huh. Oh, yeah, that's a powerful question. That's the one. That's the one. By that logic, I'd say no time. No time. No time. Oh, I mean, if, if, if you've got that spot on that rash and the medicine's not working, do, taking a double dose of it doesn't help, right? Right. No, it's true. Yeah. Doubling down is not going to help. Can you repeat? Please? Yes. How long? We, so she's already said, first question was, what are you going to do if the market says no? Now, again, a seller with no motivation may come back with, well, I'll just, you know, I'll, I'm not in a hurry. Listen, you guys, write this down. For people that are significantly out of reality, buyers and sellers, mm -hmm. time does not solve stupidity. <laughs> well, no, darn it. That's bad. Yeah. I, I, I wouldn't say that to them. I'm just letting you know. Time no, you're right. Solve. How long would you take the same medicine until... So when I asked the question, what will you do? She said, well, I'll have to lower it. Then I'll, I'll, now the next question is, how long are you going to wait before you lower it? Now she's being transferred, right? And so that dictates, she has to start in like October 1st. So that kind of gives you a timeline. How about these people that are retired and don't have a timeline? Well, I don't know, maybe, you know, maybe, I don't know, a month or two or three. Then I'll ask the question, so, so let me ask you, how long are you willing to take the wrong medicine knowing that it's not working before you take the right medicine? They usually come back and say, well, how long, how long should I? And I, I said, well, here's the thing. The doctor will know the medicine's not working sometimes before the patient's willing to accept it's not working hmm. because the next move might be surgery, which is a little in, invasive. They would rather spray Windex on their rash, right? So I'll tell you what, I'm, I'll know within a week if it's right or not. Many sellers won't be ready to reposition that fast. I'm just kind of curious how long you'll, you'll take. Now, why will you guys know in a week? Sue, why will you know in a week? Coming to you now, how will you know in a week that you're, that you're not priced right? Goings and offers. Unmute, Sue. Unmute. Sue, unmute. Ah, I'm sorry. Um, because I don't have any showings, I don't have any offers. No, 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 one at a time. Outcome number one is what? Number one is I have little action, no showings. Okay. Now, hang on. I'm going to perfect you on this because that will get you in trouble. You can't, okay. say, you can't say little showings. It's 
or no show and just low to no. Low to no. The sellers that say, well, we had a showing a month ago. It's that low was to no showings. To no. Okay. Low to no. That means, and if you look at the drawing, you guys can get this drawing by going to Danny Grimes Mastermind and just put in your email address. And then this is a good time for our commercial, so I don't forget. Um, Sebastian, will you tell them about my YouTube channel? Absolutely, guys. We have a great opportunity to connect with uh, Danny by YouTube. So I'm going to click on the link. I'm going to paste it here. Just follow and subscribe to Danny uh, Delivers. It's a great channel where you can find scripts and mm -hmm. role plays with other bold coaches as well. So don't miss it. Danny Go ahead. I'm sorry. Danny Delivers. That's yeah. Well, there's two things. Danny Delivers Mastermind. That's Facebook. Then Sebastian put in my YouTube. Go there because all of my classes that I had delivered in the past, all of the videos, the Zooms, the role plays, I've got like four months, three months of stuff is all right there. You can listen to it at your leisure. And I do, I do like hours and hours and hours of this. You guys, what we're learning here is not just scripts. It's thinking. It's strategic placements of the questions. Believe me. When you're working with a buyer or seller, you're on the clock. You only have so many minutes, so many ticks of the clock while you have their attention span. Not everyone's attention spans. Well, I mean, it's getting shorter and shorter, right? So you better get to the center of the Tootsie Roll Pop fast. And it's done by asking the right question. So outcome number one is low to no showings. So I'm going back to, who was I role playing with? Is she there or is she gone? I'm here. No, I'm still here. Well, Susan's there. I'm, I was talking to though. It was Sue. I wanted well, to say. Number two, Sue. <laughs> Barbie. Sue, what's outcome number two on the sheet? Fishing sheet. So the property has offers, but no, it has showings, but no offers. Right. Or maybe a low offer. What's the correction? Got to reposition. Low to no showings, you're way too high. Uh, uh, position two showings and the offer is a little bit too high. Outcome number three, it sells. Sells. So when you list a house that's in your sweet spot and you don't have like cars that lined up, it looks like the tryouts for American Idol in the first day or two, mm -hmm. certainly by the first week, you know you've missed something, right? Right. So, so you say this, what do you do if you uh, are representing the buyers and you're trying to talk to a listing agent who's had it listed and it's way overpriced. So they're not getting little to no showings. Yep. Well, here's the thing. You've got to find out if, if hey, uh, uh, Sue, you're the agent. Hey, Sue, yeah. uh, your, your house, I mean, is, is, is that a price that, the, that you could defend with a, some comparables that maybe I'm not familiar with? Or is the seller smoking sweet and low? What's going on? Okay. All right. Are they smoking? Well, and then, well, they're, um, you know, every, I did do the comps again um, three weeks ago. And, um, you know, every time I show the seller comps, they come back to, but my house is better. So, all right. So here's the thing. Then at least, you know, um, that maybe the agent's not already, you're not working against the agent. You, right. the, seller, the seller's not in reality, right? Right. And here's the thing, if listings aren't selling, write this down, I can tell you why. The agent's not talking or the seller's not listening. Mm -hmm. The market always speaks. Right. It only knows one word. You know what the word is? Price right. No, only one word. It only can speak one word. Only one word in every language. No. Money. Price. It need, it, the market says no, it's, it acts on yes. So the, the market will say, no, 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 no. When the right value comes and it hits it, the, right. the, the house has been on the market 85 years. Right. When it hits the right price. Right. right. Yes. Danny, but let me, let me tell you something. Why does it take sellers time to digest something that we are already telling them? Because they have alter egos and egos. <laughs> Might have to do with the way you're presenting your information or just something you're not. Getting to them. Oh, if you're showing the comps and you're showing the comps and the facts are there. Hey, hey, hang on a minute. Hang on. Let's do this next call because here's the thing. Oh, uh, Mario, because you're the one that said about questions. 
the way you phrase it, they're not listening to what you're telling them. I would say, are they listening to what you're asking them? Right. Okay. Don't show them the comps. You know, have you gone over the, the comps don't mean anything. Act, the, the market's reaction is all you need to know. Comps are, you don't even need to do comps. Take every listing at a million dollars. I don't care if it's worth 200. Then bring it down until you, until you get from outcome one to outcome two. Now you know you're getting into the right price range. I'm being a little facetious. However, I'm just saying the market always knows if it's right or not. Comps don't matter. And if you have crickets out there and the seller's not getting showings, Toby Keith concert and the pool deck's not going to help. Marketing does not solve that problem, right? It's price. What we want to get, get good at is having, like Mario said, Mario, let's work on it next week, if you'll remind me, Sebastian, on the conversations we have with sellers. Because if they're not selling in this market, oh my gosh, there's a forest fire going on, and, they're, and, they're, and their wood doesn't even smell like smoke. <laughs> Miguel, you're funny. <laughs> you're a funny guy, Danny. So, hey, you're going to report your numbers, right? You're going to report your numbers. And, you know, and then we're going to, if you report your numbers all week, Miguel, I'll take all of you to Disney World. All right. Got it. Guys, I, I just want to be mindful that we have another class, uh, MREA Mastermind with uh, Team Leader Rolando Ramirez after this training. So uh, it's valuable the information that Coach uh, Danny is giving us. So let's, let's get on time next week so we can have more value, more time with Danny, okay? You guys promise me that? Yes, sir. Yes. All right. Thank you so much, Danny. Awesome. Thank yeah, you, guys. Have a wonderful Danny, day. Danny, pearls of next. wisdom. Pearls of wisdom. God thank you, you so much. You guys get on these calls. Get the conversations right. We love you. Yes. Thank you. Thanks, leadership team. Thank you.